Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, but this is actually a Mormon Media Reviews presentation. And my my frequent co-host, Rebecca B Biblioteca, is in the house. How are you doing today, Rebecca? I am great, and it is hard to pronounce Biblioteca. You have to say it five times fast to get used to it. So, You know, one thing we talked about was maybe we should start calling you Rebecca Cinemateca as well. Well, I never thought about that or Rebecca Media Tech. Or so I'm now you've got me really thinking, Steve. Yeah. We're gonna have to consider this. I don't yeah. know. Hey, what do you folks think? Should we maybe uh <laughs> switch up the nicknames down then? You let us know. Uh folks, we're so excited to have on our show today. Um, I would we, we could call her a polygamous princess royalty, Liz Phillips, granddaughter of Rulin Alred. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Did I, did I pronounce that right, Rulin? Yep, you did. Absolutely, Rulin. Okay, and then a lot of people mispronounce it, but that is the proper one. And you have a fascinating background story. And so what, what we're we're doing a special episode, and I just want to also remind you folks, that, or just let you know, that I'm going to have Liz back on. We're going to talk about more about her history of her grandfather and her background. Um, we're going to be doing that down the road. This episode, was we're going to have Liz tell us a little bit about her story, but we're going to tie it into uh, media portrayals of polygamy on movies and televisions, as well as in other media, um, how accurate it is and also how sensationalized it is. And she's going to kind of give us perspective because you literally have family who have consulted with Big Love. You have, you, 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 I mean, we've been doing like reality shows, with like with Cody and the clan. Why don't you pop it up? Let's tease it. The sister wives yeah. in the house. We're going to be talking about some inside stuff. Scoop on Cody, sister wives. We're very excited about this. So let's pop up Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Let me get to the share button screen. Oh, there we go. We found it. Let me go ahead and pull that up. I have always wanted to hear some more inside information on the Sister Wives because that is just a fascinating program. I... All right. Here we go. There it is. This is... There it is. Cody this is Cody Humphrey. Brown. Look at that. So yes, folks, we're going to little yeah. talk about Cody. We're going to talk about Big Love. We're going to talk about all these other uh, Keep Sweet, all these stories, these uh, podcasts and these movies and shows that have come out to talk about polygamy. And we're going to talk about, aren't you related to one of these sister wives? Yes, I am. I'm related to Christine. So her and I have the same grandpa, Rulin Allred. So he was the leader of the AUB in the 1950s, 60s, and through the 70s until he was murdered by a rival cult leader so yes we have the same grandpa different grandmothers of course <laughs> which one is christine in this picture for those that oh, are she's on the far left, left. So she's on the far left okay yes yes that's great wow. all right well that's really cool so we're teasing and that's what we're going to be talking about that too um we actually kind of put together a little slideshow on the fly today uh which was kind of fun and uh liz is going to also kind of give us a little bit about her background and visualize uh, her life story but before we get started there, I just want to welcome you so much to the show, Liz. Um, very excited to have you on today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to dive in and kind of get this discussion going. There's a lot of um, interesting things that go along with media and polygamy. So it'll be interesting to dive into some of the different aspects. And I think uh, this is the key thing. So like you actually had a family member who consulted with Big Love and she was, a lot of this was... The, the characters were a lot of them based on your grandfather. Um, yes. I want you to tell, we're going to talk about how they feel, how the polygamy was portrayed on that show. But I just want you to kind of give us a little background on yourself and also your grandfather. Let's start with your grandfather. What kind of man he was? Because I find it to be, he's there's a lot more to the story than him just being like another warm just because he was far from being that kind of person. Yes, yes. And uh, let me know. Actually, let me just pull up a really fast picture of him so you guys can know who I'm talking about if, for those who don't know. So this is my grandfather, Rulin Allred, and he grew up in the mainstream LDS church and his father got interested in polygamy and he was trying to tell his father to stay out of polygamy and ended up being a polygamist himself. He had um, originally seven wives. Um, he lost his first wife. And so he was the leader of um, a polygamist group that created a schasm um, 
between a whole bunch of polygamist leaders. And that's kind of where the break off happened with Warren Jeffs and my grandpa, Rulin Allred. They had some disagreements on um, who had the priesthood power, who held all the keys. So he started gaining a lot of notoriety and some of his characteristics was he was actually extremely kind. He was a naturopathic um, healist physician. So he didn't have a medical degree, but he did go to chiropractic school, chiropractor school and um, had kind of a doctor's office in Murray. And he was from all accounts from anyone that I've talked to, which has included his wives, um, his brothers his children, that he was a very, very good man, that he was the pattern, um, the ideal of how to live polygamy, that, that, that he was basically the pinnacle, the thing to strive to be. So in all accounts, he was very kind, very loving, very attentive to everyone around him. He was extremely scriptorial, um, uh, spiritual, and a very good leader, charismatic and loving. So Oftentimes, especially in media, we hear of of these leaders who are cruel and secretive and unkind and predators or pedophiles, and and he was none of those. He was um, extremely respectful. In fact, one of the reasons why they had broken off was because he didn't believe in child br brides, and he had a lot of respect for women. His wives were extremely respected. And, and he was a good pattern for other men. He was just, from all accounts, just an amazing man. I have never personally met him. He was murdered by Herbal LeBaron in 1977, and I was born in 1979. So I personally have never met him, but 100% of the stories that I've heard from anyone that I've ever encountered had been positive. He was a very, very good man and his wives loved him very, very much. And can you tell us what the name of the polygamous group was and maybe give us a sense of the size or where you were at once you split? Yeah. So, the, so back in the 1950s, when they were doing the polygamous raids and imprisoning all these men, it was a very loose group. There wasn't really a church established. There really wasn't a name. They were supposed to be in tandem with the mainstream LDS church. They were waiting for the church to accept polygamy again. So it really wasn't a specific church. There wasn't really a name. They called it the group or the order. Um, and, and so it was very loose. It wasn't until that big schasm happened that it broke off more. And uh, we, I grew up calling it the group, but its official name is the Apostolic United Brethren. That's kind of what it turned into, um, especially after my grandpa passed away. That was, and then obviously the fundamental Latter-day Saints, the FLDS was where the Warren Jeffs kind of broke off and went somewhere else. And there's there seems to be a lot of um, break-offs that seem to happen a lot, uh, but those were the main ones that kind of created most of the followers that happened. So it's that's the group that I grew up in was the Apostolic United Brethren. Yeah, that's so interesting because I think a lot of us who don't know a lot about it think, oh, everyone is everyone who is a polygamist is a LDS, and that is not the case at all. And there sounds like very different <laughs> ideologies and and ways of living in the different groups. So it's good to understand the distinction. Very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, was there anything about you know because this is the thing you have an interesting story. Um, actually, what's what makes you so unique is that. You were a member of this group. Your father was the prophet afterwards. And uh, yes. so maybe we could talk a little bit about that too, but also, um, and then just so you know, folks, she would later then leave the group and become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then would later leave that as well. And of course, Rebecca, you might want to talk a little bit about where people can maybe find out more about her story too. Yeah, Liz's story is absolutely amazing. And Another side gig I have, I run a post-Mormon, nuanced Mormon book club called The Good Book Club, and we had Liz on and just an amazing multimedia presentation, talked about her entire life for an hour or so. So if anybody's interested in hearing this 
bigger story of Liz, because there's no way we can cover it just right here. Um, you could get in contact with us. You can find us on Facebook or you can email me at thegoodbookclub at mail.com. And I can hook you up with the link to this incredible interview that we had with Liz a couple weeks ago. So there's always more to the story. And Liz is just amazing. So thanks for letting me plug that, Steve. Oh, no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, so just a really quick, I'm going to go ahead and just share a little bit so that you guys are aware of um, the succession. So my grandfather was murdered in 1977 by Herbal LeBaron's two wives that had dressed up as um, men and then walked into his office and and murdered him with guns. And so um, when he passed away, his brother Owen became the prophet. And then later, this is a picture of my father. Um, he became a prophet in 2014. And these are the original five wives that he had. And my mom is on the bottom with a pink cardigan on. So she's sitting there. And then this is a picture at my father's funeral who passed away this past October. It's been a year. And um, those are most of my siblings. So I'm kind of smack dab in the middle right next to, of course, the shortest person. And I'm one of the taller end ones. So we get to be stick out like a sore thumb. But um, I'm kind of smack dab in the middle. I've got all of these. These are these are from oldest to youngest. So I'm kind of smack dab in the middle. I have 36 siblings. But um, I actually have more than that that have been sealed to other moms at a later date, but, uh, biologically there's 36 of us, uh, well, 37 of us. So, um, there's just a lot of siblings. So he was the prophet from 2014 until last year. So I have, um, a prophet, my grandpa being prophet on my mom's side, and then I have my dad being prophet. So that's kind of on both sides. It's, it's been touched on both sides. And then Steve kind of touched a little bit on um, joining the mainstream LDS church. So on this left is a photo of me being baptized when I was eight years old into the AUB. That is my dad baptizing me in the font. There is a baptismal font right in the building at the AUB. Um, and then this is when I was 18. So I decided to join the church at 16, the mainstream LDS church. And when you come from a polygamous background, you're treated um, a it was similar to the 2015 uh, policy that had been then rescinded, but they never rescinded it for polygamists because polygamists are still awful people, according to mainstream LDS. So um, I did have to have an interview with Elder Holland. I did have to wait till I was 18. And then I was baptized at 18. So baptized once at eight and once again at 18. So that's just, my just real quick uh, for our audience who isn't aware of the November uh, policy was they extended to the children of LGBTQ parents. They were treated the same way, but they couldn't get baptized till they're 18. And then they renounced their 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 parents. Uh, that was that was what that all was. They were just trying to do the same thing with LGBTQ folk as they were doing that. I just want to clarify that for those of you who are not familiar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. So those are my, those were my two baptisms and that's kind of where it's brought me here, where I kind of have um, a background of polygamy, but then also mainstream LDS. That's quite a, quite a remarkable thing. And, and, you know, so it just to have, you know, and this is the thing, you know, um, I've been taking this journey throughout the restoration and I've been meeting with a lot of different groups. And last year, I started these series of conversations with Benjamin Schaefer. And then their last fall general conference at their temple in Nevada, I he said, hey, I've got a great idea for an episode, Steve. He said, why don't I just line up a bunch of people on our church and you just they come and sit in front of the camera and you talk to them for like each one. So I went from age 17 to age 87, every demographic of that church in between. And it was a really eye-opening experience for me because I had this stereotype in my mind about polygamists. And I found these people to be wonderful people and I could be a neighbor to any of them. And I would, I would call them friend because they're great people. And I have this great relationship with the Righteous Branch, Benjamin Schaefer's group, or that he's affiliated with. He's not the prophet. And um, I tell people, I said, I taped that on a Saturday night. And you know, you understand, I didn't know who was going to be plopped in front of the camera next. The, the, one of the key ones was the, the last surviving plural wife of the founding prophet. I got to interview her. And 
that was just fascinating. And then I, I tell people, I said, this was a Saturday night. And I said, and I used to party a lot. I used to go hang out at the bars and do all this kind of stuff. You know, I said, this was definitely a top five Saturday night. The only difference is I remember this one. <laughs> yeah. but it was it was just absolutely uh eye-opening that was my big that's been my biggest surprise is how human and how nice polygamists are and so they are um unfairly maligned in the media and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have you come on the program because we kind of wanted you just to kind of give us like a an overview of how you uh, some examples of different tv series and other media um how they have portray portrayed the the principle and so i thought we could talk about that today and i just thought liz why don't you just kind of start us off on uh well just before we do that overall before we do the slide presentation give me an over your overall impression of how polygamy is portrayed on the media in the media okay uh that's a really good question i i feel like it's fascinating to people because it's unknown. It's a small sect of people. Um, but what sells and what draws people in is the drama. Um, um, and, and it can be a very clickbaity situation. So when people first found out I was polygamist, even in my early twenties, they would go, Oh, did you have to escape? Um, nope. I didn't have to run away from my parents because that's what was being portrayed in the media. They didn't know that there were different sects of polygamists. They didn't know that the majority of polygamists are just doing their best to live their best lives. But what was being portrayed in the media was one-sided um, and it was very sensationalized. So that was a constant question. Did I have to escape? Um, where's my dress? Did I have to wear my hair the way that they wore their hair? Um, and it was really hard because it, it took, it took a lot for me to have to educate them that, that there's a lot of polygamists out there that look a lot like us and it, they're just not that exciting. They're just trying to live their best lives. So that part was hard. Um, and then, they're, they always, um, things like Big Love, Sister Wives, um, Warren Jeffs, the Keep Sweet documentary that we're going to kind of touch on. All of those things are very sensationalized. They're very scary. Um, and it's, it's, it makes it so that, um, it's very one-sided and it's, oh, it's always so awful. And that's kind of what draws people in is these awful stories. That's why true crime is so big, um, with podcasts and with shows and because it's so sensationalized and there are polygamists out there that are awful people. Those are what's being focused on in the media. That's just not that exciting. And don't get clicks when you find out there's a man that's trying their best to be kind to all of his wives and support all of them and love his children and and be a righteous person and be a good person. So I think overall media really tries to sensationalize um, polygamists because it's so different, which is makes people interested. And there's a, definitely a dark side that can be exposed and that is part of polygamy that they like to expose. So it feels really one-sided and very dark and very scary. And that's what I butt up against a lot when people hear of my background is they're asking me, oh, do you, do you know who Warren Jeffs is? Oh, did you, did you watch this show? And I do watch all of them, but Shows like Sister Wives, I don't follow really closely because it's like watching how I grew up. So why would I watch something that I've experienced? So um, media portrays polygamy as a very sensationalized and, and it's it's just very, it can be very boring and very mainstream too. That's not what's being portrayed in, in media. So you know, I, I I want you to hop in on this too, Rebecca. But I just have a real quick thing. I just as as, as you're talking, speaking of media, I uh, you know I had Ann Wild come on my program, and she was involved in basically when the Winter Olympics were coming to Salt Lake City, they decided we need because we're gonna have all this world media coming to Utah, and she's like, we need to be able to um, maybe put together something where we can be the public face of polygamy. And we can tell our story and not to have the church tell our story, but we are able to do it. Um, actually, she sent me a book. I think it's called Voices in Harmony that gives women give their voices of their practicing the principle. 
Um, but she felt like it was so important that they do that. So she and this the few other women, um, you know, believe in particular, uh, she and, and Anne actually went to all the different groups and said, we got to work, coordinate this, this PR campaign and and how important it was to, to get the right message out. I just found that to be very fascinating to talk to somebody because even, even then, back then, 27 years ago, they, they realized it's important that we get our stuff out there because all the media was in Utah for the Olympics. Yeah, it, it is. It's a it's a hard it's a pull. There's a pull. There's a separation between the two, because on one side, on one side, they feed off of lying for the Lord, um, being more righteous, um, being secretive. And part of it is the 1950 raids, men being in, put in jail, losing their families because of polygamy, the shame that the mainstream LDS uh, preaches about polygamists makes it kind of a shameful thing to talk about. So so they get this pull of like, they don't want to go out into the media, especially if they're just trying their best to be good. They don't want a lot of attention. They're not seeking a lot of attention. I know that when, because Cody Brown and his wives come from the apostolic united brethren i have had him and we'll dive into that um a lot of people from the aub did not like that he started his own show that he had it kind of exposed to them and brought attention to them so we're kind of hitting into this dichotomy of like yes they want to be portrayed good in media but how successful was Anne Wild in getting um, people a united front to be able to talk about these things because they don't want to? What if they get in trouble in the law later? Um, it's it's a very um, sacred thing to them. A lot of people treat it very, and they don't. And if you're taught in Mormon world, sacred means secret, which means you're not going to go out and be advertising that you're living such a sacred high law, higher law. So it's this, this pull between how much do we talk about it and how much just to like, let people know that not everyone's evil. And then how much do we just keep to ourselves and have it between a relationship between me and God or me and my family. So it's, it's a hard pull between the two. It's, it's a definite struggle for polygamists to know where the balance is. That's such a good point. And I think you also touched on something that I've kind of been thinking about as you've been talking. I mean, that is the shame of mainstream Mormons as they watch this. It's different from someone who's not a Mormon and watches and they're more just like, oh, that's horrible. Mainstream Mormons, that's our past. And I think they have this inordinate sense that they have to really, you know, speak out against it. You know, some of these theories that have come out, they're like, no, you know, other people just watch it in passing mainstream Mormons really, and I think it's based on shame. That was it, us. That is a lot of our background. And we look at it, we see it portrayed, and we just want to create a huge distance. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Just the way that Mormons may watch it differently, mainstream Mormons, than, you know, just your average viewer. They Definitely. Know I mean, I, I 100% agree. I think in the night, there was a huge push in especially the 19, obviously 1950s, where they were imprisoning polygamous men, because it was, it's like a dark spot on their history that um, mainstream LDS has actively tried to erase and downplay and um, kind of pull out pieces that are not being t taught every Sunday that um, really the higher law, the celestial law, the way to get into the celestial kingdom is through polygamy. That was the original doctrine coming straight from Joseph Smith. They don't want that supported. They want to redefine what it means to go into the celestial kingdom, into the highest heavens. Let's just say that. Um, and so they try very hard. They don't want polygamists in mainstream media talking about these things because that's bringing up their past that they would rather bury. So it is, it's a very hard thing, even for mainstream LDS people to watch and see. So they like that it looks evil and awful and dark and blood atonement. And, oh, look, he's a pedophile. That's, it. I mean, look how he skewed it all and messed it up and pertaining to Warren Jeffs. So in a lot of ways, my grandpa, who was none of those things, um, don't really fit into that. So where does that fit in into the media? He didn't fit any of those things. And a lot of men don't. There are a lot of really good men who try very hard to be good. So it is it's it's a very complex issue. There's a lot of different things playing into how, why polygamists look the way they do in in media. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I just find it really interesting because in my own family growing up, they were fairly Orthodox Mormons and we celebrated polygamy. We were not polygamous, but we definitely celebrated it in our past. I knew that I was named after the second wife of, you know, this person. And I mean, I, I knew all that. And we had pictures of our polygamous ancestors in their prison gear displayed in our house. So polygamy was celebrated. And I also knew that that was something, you know, in the next life that we would all be practicing. Yet, if anything was portrayed in the media of it, my family, well, no, you know, they wanted nothing to do with it. So I thought that's very strange because we're celebrating that in my family and it is our future yet. They don't want to look at it in a, in a current lens, if that makes sense. So it's, an, it's a conflict, I think. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should now take our little stroll through media portrayals of polygamy. And so you, we, uh, you put together a little uh, slideshow and just kind of let's let's talk about some of the shows, some of the. Uh, you could like the big gloves and the then the sister wives and, and just you know because we you have intimate knowledge of these programs <laughs> in many ways and so let's let's talk about that okay yeah there's the big yeah one. um yeah so big love was an early 2000s show it had five seasons and um i i have a, a pretty good relationship with one of my aunts she has written a few books on her growing up with her dad, Rulin Allred, and she was actually a consultant on Big Love, especially at the beginning when they were first launching it. Um, and Big Love is a loose betrayal, betrayal of um, Rulin Allred and his wives. So obviously there was originally seven in real life, but seven's a lot to put on a show. And um it's my aunt ended up ended up just not really enjoying working with them because she felt that they had sensationalized, sexualized, and dramatized the kind of the intricate details and family life of my grandpa. So um if if any of your viewers have watched Big Love, there is one wife there that seems very conservative and kind of gets pulled off into kind of a more conservative group and her dad is is part of this more conservative group that is very accurate of what happened in with my grandpa he was married to one of uh rule and jeff's um family members and she did fill that poll to go to more conservative um polygamy and 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 in real life eventually she actually did leave my grandpa and take her family down to the FLDS and they no longer spoke to each other. So um, that part of it is very accurate. The wives with their different personalities um, definitely came through in big love. Um, and in big love, he is portrayed as a very good man. My grandpa was a very good man. The, the things that I think um, my aunt who worked very closely with them and other people uh, in the polygamous group struggle with is the sexualization. Um, it shows in the first episode that he's like hawking Viagra to like keep up with the sex with all the women. And that is not accurate. Um, he definitely would not have been doing that. And, and it polygamy for these, especially my grandpa was not about sex and multiple women. It was about honoring God and living the higher law and getting to the ultimate place in heaven. Um, so it had it, it, sex obviously is part of it. They had lots of children, but it wasn't that sexualized. And I think um, that was a very hard place for my family and especially my aunt to see the way that they took my grandpa's story and part of the great parts or interesting parts and, and, and kind of dramatized it, sexualized it and made it so big. Um, I think, um, and then there's this other element, um, that is taught in growing up in polygamy in mainstream Mormon, where you turn away from all evil. So oftentimes if you're a very righteous Mormon, if there is a movie or a book that has a swear word or a sex scene or um, a lot of murdering, then you would get up and leave the theater or you wouldn't finish watching the, reading the book or you wouldn't finish watching the show. So that was also really hard too, because as a Mormon, you're trying to keep your body clean 
treat it like the temple that it is. Do not watch media, listen to things, music, other things that are deemed as like wicked or worldly. Well, here's this show about polygamy and this man trying to be so righteous. And then they've thrown in these, you know, gross parts that now it's like, well, I, now I can't watch it because there's a sex scene. And and now it's, it's a bad show because of, and they, they could miss out on a lot of the good and the intricacy and the complexity of the show. So I thought it was interesting. I did watch it in that it felt a lot of the stories that I had heard growing up were betrayed on screen. That was interesting. Um, but I personally, as someone who has um, matured in different ways, did not enjoy the sexualization of it either. That that felt very Hollywood to me. But I, I understand that's kind of like a clickbait thing. They want to kind of draw people in and want them to watch it. And, and, and that is one of the questions that is asked often of polygamists, like, well, how do you have sex with all these women? And how do you how do you satisfy all of them? And how does that even work? And are you all in the same bedroom? And, and what does that look like? And so I know that it is um, a very hot topic that needs to be addressed. I think it is interesting. It is a good question. Um, but in big love, it was definitely a, um, an extreme version of version to make a lot of people be interested in it. You know, so. I was my, my mom, my family, a lot of my family were very similar. If there was a swear word in a movie or like, why did they have to put that in there? Or they would leave movies. Uh, so I have a very similar background. But then this the other thing, you know, we were talking off camera beforehand, is that if you can get past the pilot episode, the very first episode, that was the most sexual episode. Because we were talking about how when they do a pilot episode, they throw in everything that's going to be in the series is going to be all thrown in there when they're taking it to be, you know, when they're uh, se selling it to different, uh, you know, groups. And HBO eventually picked it up and HBO, they would be like, well, yeah, that's what we do. We do a lot of sex stuff, you know? And so that was kind of part of the reason. But if you can get past the first episode, it is not as sexual as, uh, as the first episode is. And, and, and there are times when, um, but I, I have to say, this is what my mom and I watched the series together. And what I would do is I'd watch, we, we, we had the, we got the HBO package, you know, and uh, I'd watch the episode ahead of time. And then I would watch it with her. So I could, so I could fast forward over the naughty bits for her <laughs> and I'll be like, well, mom, during this sex season, he says this to her. You need to know that, that he said that, you know, <laughs> and so, so my mom's still that way. And it just reminds me of my similar cultural background. <laughs> So fun. Yeah, Big Love was kind of a revelation to me almost, because as I said, my background, polygamy was celebrated, but as I became older, I was angry about that, that it existed in my family. I It was a real trigger for me because I only sort of saw the negative sides of it. So here I am, you know, later have kids married and Big Love comes on and it definitely showed me a side of people just cooperating and living. The fact that they had a little cul-de-sac and all their backyards connected. I mean, for the first time, it, it didn't vilify it for me. And I started to think of my own polygamist history, you know, grand, great grandparents and everything that I had thought they must have just been, it must have just been a nightmare. This is the first time that I thought, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it was okay for some of the women. Maybe it was all right. It just gave me a different perspective, human beings, living, loving. It was a totally revolutionary idea to me because I had completely vilified it and I was horrified by it up to that point. So I saw a different side by watching Big Love. I love that. I love that it, it humanized it and made it seem almost more acceptable instead of so sensationalized that these people didn't actually seem human, that they go through all these human motions of jealousy and love and happiness and sense of community, which is a huge pull. I know in mainstream LDS, uh, we often talk about, it doesn't matter where you move in the world. If you're LDS, you can um, get, you have an automatic community. You just find the local ward house. Um, that is a huge pull in polygamy, especially if you've grown up in it. It's a very small community where they definitely love and support each other and help each other out in a lot of ways. Um, and that's beautiful. There's a lot of um, 
heal healing soul parts of having a community that you feel so belonged to. So I do love that, that it, it humanized it for you. I, it's interesting because I didn't really think of it that way for me. It feels like it's always trying so hard to be sensationalized. So I love that part. Yeah, I definitely picked that part out of it just because, you know, I I was thinking, wow, look, they're helping each other with the children. The children love all the moms. It's a it's a big community, you know, so I never pictured that way because I was so triggered by it in my own family and my family history. Yeah, interesting. yeah, definitely. Um, Steve, did you want to touch on sister wives for a yeah. minute? Is that yeah, let's talk about sister wives? Okay. And, now, and we're also going. <laughs> I think that's the most this. well-known polygamous portrayal. Yeah. I think that's what mo- almost everyone has heard of, and they're always in the news doing something. So <laughs> yeah, they they do seem to be. Even if you don't watch the show, yeah, you, know, you seem to get information about them. Um, does that? Do you feel like that happens, Steve? Where you're you're getting information, even if you're not necessarily yeah, watching it. You know? I'm just walking in the grocery store and you look at yes. the cover of people and yeah. they're on it, you know, and, and actually I, I just, so of course I'm always interested in everything in Mormon. So I actually watched the, the, the first episode when it aired and I, it was, I'm not into reality TV, you know, so I, but I at least watched it. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. I even thought at the time I said, they really, they couldn't have picked like out of central casting. Like these are like, if you're going to put your best face forward, this is the first episode of only, but you're going to put your first best face forward for polygamy. They definitely picked the right people. Yeah. They had the charisma. They seem, they actually seem normal. Like, like Cody seems like he's kind of a cool guy, you know? Uh, so it, it was, I was like, wow, this, they did a pretty good job. They picked the right family to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can share my screen if you want to with a picture of the sister wives. Um, but I do, I, I have a couple actually very interesting stories about Cody specifically. So, um, sister wives, like I previously said is from my group of the apostolic United brethren. They, if you want to loosely kind of characterize them, they are the most similar to mainstream LDS church. And that is deliberate. Um, my grandpa Rulin loved mainstream LDS church and taught from the pulpit that one day they would be reunited. So we very much worked in tandem with um, mainstream LDS. So they look very Mormon. Uh, the, the garments underneath, you know, um, mainstream LDS have garments that they wear specific underwear that has special meaning. Um, the AUB also has that, but they're old school garments. So they, um, go down to the ankles and wrists. Um, it's not a huge, huge deal. If you kind of like roll them up and put them above your elbow, so you can maybe like show a little bit of forearm if you want to. So you can kind of see, yeah, I know. So, so, um, but anyway, that's why a lot of times, especially with Robin, you'll see her wearing like a short sleeve shirt and then like a long sleeve shirt underneath that's to kind of cover her garments. Um, so it's been interesting to see kind of the progression of the show and, and who's now wearing short sleeve shirts. It's like, Ooh, did they roll that up? Did they roll their garments up or are they not wearing their garments, who knows? Um, so that part is interesting. So, so Cody, his, from what I remember, he convert his, his mom and dad converted. And then, so he didn't like necessarily wasn't born into it, but he did grow up into it. And, um, he is the same age as a lot of my older siblings. So I am nine of 10 And so I'm one of the younger ones, but my mom loved teenagers and young adults. And she, we had a one acre property and we had a volleyball net and a basketball court. And she would have teenagers and young adults at her house all the time. She was like the party house for polygamists, for play kids. And they would come over and have volleyball games and um, sit and chat. My, my mom was very, very social. She loved talking to people. So Um, her kids would invite their friends over and he would come over to our house quite often. So he knew my mom and my dad, um, growing up and my sister and her husband worked with Cody. So my sister, oh, my sister and her husband owned, um, I think a construction company. Nope. It was an excavation company. So they had a lot of big machinery 
And so one of the most interesting stories was um, I was on a couple's vacation with another mainstream LDS couple. It was my husband and I and, and this other couple and we're in Vegas and we're at a pool and Cody and Robin are at the pool. I know who they are because of who I grew up, but I wasn't going to go say anything. The The woman, the wife that I was with was um, a fangirling over Cody and Robin and she was freaking out. She was like, oh, Liz, it's Cody and Robin. And oh my gosh, I want to go say hi to them. I want to go take a picture of them. What do you think? And I was like, I don't know. Let me call my sister who has worked specifically with Cody and just kind of see what the story is. And my sister said, uh, yeah, he'll know exactly who you are. She, he knows who our mom and dad are. Um, he actually had um, driven one of the huge machinery pieces into a ditch while he was working for my husband and we had to get a crane and it was this whole thing and it was this big production. So he's absolutely going to know who my husband is and who I am. And so if you just want to introduce yourself and, and tell them who your mom and dad is and who I am. And then I'm sure he'll want to talk to you. And I was like, okay, I can do that. So I take the fan girl over with me and we go over to meet Cody and Robin. And I said, um, Hey Cody, I'm Liz. My mom is Rhoda and Lynn. Um, I think that you've been to our house a lot of times. And, and I think you worked with, um, my sister and her husband. And he goes, Rhoda, Rhoda, Rhoda. Oh uh, yeah, I think that kind of sounds familiar. Oh, okay. And then and then I said, okay, well, I think you worked for my brother-in-law and and my sister. And he goes, ah, oh, Graydon, Graydon, oh Graydon, oh uh, yeah, I th- I, th- I think I can kind of remember them. And that it kind of it took me aback. Like, wait a minute from what it sounds like you should know these people, um, in, in our community, the AUB is very small. And, and just a reminder, my mom came straight from rule and all red, like people knew my mother in that community, people knew my dad. So it was a very weird way to react. And I was like, okay, well, um, I just came up to say hi. And and I've got my friend here and she loves your show. And she was wondering if she could maybe take a picture with you. Oh, no, 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 says Cody. No, he starts covering Robin up. We don't want any pictures of, of us out there with Robin. Like that, that is inappropriate. We're not going to be, we just, we definitely don't feel comfortable. Okay, well, thank you. And I was like, well, it was nice to meet you. And I guess we'll talk later. I mean, it was just such a, I, I called my sister after and I said, she, he acted like he had no idea who we were. And, and she goes, that is completely untrue. He worked for my husband for years. He's been to our house multiple times. Um, and I have talked to a couple different people from the AUB that I've reconnected with and, and they all have not very favorable stories of Cody. He seemed, um, he felt that he was hot stuff. So once a month at the AUB, they have dances and they're so fun. I highly recommend dances from the AUB there. They do. It's just so fun. They're doing round dances and the Virginia reel and, and just there's waltzing. And I mean, it's just, I miss the dances from the AUB and he would come in, um, very high and mighty and would actually walk in front of other men and be like, Oh, you don't want to dance with him. You probably want to dance with me. And he would snap up like the really cute girls. So, um, yeah, we, we have some stories of, of Cody and, and our interactions with him. So I personally don't know him very well, but he's been very well connected with our family. And then that is my cousin, Christine. So we have the same grandpa. So, um, it's, it's interesting to see, she looks very much like an all red to me. So that's, it's really kind of fun to see her. And I love watching her carry herself with grace and she's decided to leave Cody. That's kind of what this last season is about. And she has handled herself really well. And I've enjoyed watching her carry herself so well through such a hard, difficult time and having it in the media at the same time has been, I'm sure, very difficult for her. And my heart goes out to her and her kids and everyone else that's involved because it's a very hard thing anyway to go through a divorce and then to have it over having so many people have an opinion about your divorce has got to be hard. Um, 
and then having it all across the media has, has got to be difficult too. So that's my, that's my personal story with the sister wives, Steve and Rebecca, do you have any follow-up questions with that? I'm wondering the motivation of Cody. Do you think it's just to completely distance himself from the realities of that community and to just put himself forward as more independent? Or I'm just trying to think of what the motivation would be. Cause I mean, how long ago had he worked with your family? It couldn't have been 20 years or, I mean, it would have had to be fairly something someone would remember, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Say that is motivation. If you have any idea. Yeah. I, I'm not sure his motivation. I, I, maybe he was trying to distance himself. It's, it's himself. It's been interesting to see. I don't watch the show, the show. Um, I do follow some people who will comment on the show. Um, I personally, especially at the beginning of the seasons felt like it was just a show about my family. So there was not a pull for me to watch it. It wasn't sensationalized. I didn't have any questions about how the wives all worked together because I grew up watching my moms work together. I didn't have a question about how sex worked because I knew how it worked. Um, I had no interest in watching a million kids running around because there were a million kids running around for me. And that's just, that was my reality. So why would I watch something that just looked like me growing up? Mm. Um, there was no sensationalization for me. Um, so I personally was not really connected, but, um, from what I understand, it sounds like he has distanced himself and become more independent. And it would be interesting to hear why, because, when my dad became prophet of that group in 2014, he was a polarizing figure himself for a few different reasons. And we don't have to get into those, uh, but he actually did lose some of his followers when he came into power. And I don't know if that was maybe when Cody said, I'm done because I know some of my own family members that when my dad became prophet was like, I'm out. I can't follow him. I can't be in the AUB. That may have been where he distanced himself, where he may believe in polygamy and believe in the patriarchy, celestial kingdom, higher law, priesthood, all of those things that can go along with it, but maybe don't agree that my dad was the next prophet. And that could have been where he kind of separated. That would be interesting to hear because I do know that my dad was polarizing and did lose followers because of that. Interesting. Yeah, it's and, and a lot of people don't realize is most polygamists are actually independent uh, that are practicing the principle. Uh, many don't actually belong to any particular group. Uh, I, we've, I've had Ogden Kraut's widow on. Of course, we talked about that earlier. Um, and they were they remained independent. So there's a lot of people that are also secretly practicing it. So the idea that Cody would go independent wouldn't be that big of a surprise, I guess then. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not too, especially with his move from Utah where he lived in a very polygamist um, place. Um, Eagle mountain Lehigh area is very, there's a lot of my family members live there. There's communities where they're a little bit more concentrated than other areas. Um, and then he moved to Vegas, which polygamists think that's the sin city. So like, you know, there's not a big, I mean, there are some, but not a lot. So yeah, it would be interesting to know where kind of the breakoff was. Um, but leading into that, speaking of that kind of when he kind of was not fully in, um, the TLC did carry a show for about a year called My Five Wives. Um, and it's actually missing my sister, Rosemary, over here. There's actually five of them. I don't know why they cut off my sister, or but she's my half-sister. Um, and she was actually standing here in the picture. I'll have to find one of them with her in it. Um, but this is Brady Williams and they are part of the AUB too. So I think this, these families work well if for like ongoing shows like TLC, TLC shows, because they're a little bit more mainstream. So they don't create such a big splash, such a big dramatization, maybe like legal issues are not being thrown in there as much. Um, so, but they only lasted a year. The show I do have some connections there and the show came back to them and said, if, if you can't like create some more drama, like you're just not pulling people in, we're going to have to let you go as a show. And he said, well, I, I don't want to do that. So 
Um, and so they lost their show after one year because they just weren't as exciting enough. And, and on that same mainstream, Cody, after so many seasons, TLC kind of did the same thing. Like you guys just aren't exciting enough. And Cody and his wives took a pay cut to stay on TLC and have their show continue on. So they're not earning as much as they used to at the beginning too. Hmm. Oh, wow. I just assumed there just seems to be enough drama on that show as it is. I, I'm surprised that they didn't think there was enough because man, I mean, I, I, I just thought, Oh, they went that direction. They took that, 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 and went with it, but they actually are, they had their salaries reduced for not being sensational. Yeah. Oh. And I think it was early on. So I think they're on season 14. I want to say, I don't really know, but so they've been on for a while. And I do think there were a few seasons where it was kind of, you know, just everyday life, kids growing up and going to college and wives trying to figure out how to live with their husband and just life. So it just wasn't exciting enough. So like I imagine said, they we're get, living they, that. So they, they get pay raises when the got when the drama started amping <laughs> yeah, up. I don't know. <laughs> They're really good question. scale of levels of drama that if you can do this, then you get this. If this happens, yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. So did you, Liz, watch, um, and now this is not your group, this is over to the FLDS, did you watch recently the Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey? Because that was just a sensation, you know, the whole God. Just... Yeah, I did. So, and again, the darker side, like you, like you just talked about, very dark. Yeah. And they've been in the media for years yeah. with how dark it's been. So that's, I mean, that's originally why I was asked if I had escaped because there's that show called escaping polygamy where they help facilitate people leaving. Um, and so I did watch that and I had actually known about those things because of my mom and the, and my aunts and the connection that they have with their siblings in the FLDS, because remember my grandpa, one of my grandpa's wives left and took her kids down there. So I have family relations that are still in there that they kind of hear whisperings and, and discussions about. So um, I had known about what was going on in the te Texas temple because of kind of whisperings of what my moms and aunts had talked about. Um, I read, I, um, the, it was, it was hard to watch in the documentary too, but those things I had been hearing about for years. Um, and it's that kind of like, when you grow up in the AUB and you hear about the extremism of FLDS, you're like, well, that's not us. Like, that's crazy. That's, we would never, you know, like we just have like this high and mighty, like, oh, they're so awful. Like they, we would never, there's no self-reflection of like what it looks like for us and how similar that we are. Um, so there's a lot of, of similar things, but yeah, Warren Rulin and then Warren especially definitely took it to a whole nother level. And um, power went to his head a lot faster. And one of the things that they kind of touched on with keep sweet was that when he came into power and he was kind of sloughing off anyone, any men that were um, questioning his power, those men were the ones that were in charge of the water of the city of Hilldale and Colorado city. Um, they were in charge of how the town ran. So when he started leaving and going into Texas and doing the secretive thing, he left Hilldale and Colorado city in ruin. He had sucked them dry of any kind of resources, any kind of money that they could have had and ruined really the infrastructure of this community who before him had learned to be so independent, self-sufficient. It was kind of like something they wore as a badge of honor that they had built up this community and the self-sufficiency um, and Warren came in and just destroyed it before he left. He destroyed not only families and people's lives, but destroyed a town and a community um, by just the way he sucked them dry monetarily, um, and structurally and spiritually. I mean, he was just, he's one of the most scariest people alive, a, a parasite that just sucks everything dry, ruins everything, and then goes on to his next thing that he can do that to. 
Um, and it's been sad because one of the things that makes it so he can do this is polygamy because there are so many women and so many children, so many people involved that he's not running dry of, um, his supply because there's just so many people, the indoctrination helps that happen. Um, the ultimate power, the patriarchy, um, and then having a lot of children and a lot of wives, there's just, this community is so big and it grows so exponentially so fast that his supply is never ending. And that's, that's what's so hard and heartbreaking to watch. Um, and that keep sweet documentary was extremely hard, but I also see, I saw a lot of parallels with the AUB and even the mainstream LDS, this don't question, just obey the taking away of critical thinking of, of noticing when things start turning bad and going, Oh, that doesn't feel right. They're taught at such an early age, even in the mainstream LDS, that doesn't feel right. Push that aside. Listen to what I'm saying, not what I'm doing, not what's happening behind the scenes, what I'm saying right now for you to do the, and the rules are not the same, right? Women's rules and men's rules. They're not equal. So he, he took that to the extremes and it was, it was really heartbreaking to watch. And that's what happens with power that's being unchecked and you have an endless supply. So yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a really hard documentary for me to watch, but I had heard so many of those whisperings before that it was fascinating to me to watch it on screen and how it affected people's lives personally. Yeah. It's a very triggering, polarizing documentary because like you say, mainstream people are absolutely saying no way. But if you look closely, not even closely, if you just look, there are so many parallels. So now I know there are uh, different groups that are going down into the FEL, L, LDS communities as they're able and supporting and setting up almost like ministries to help and support. Is your group, the AUB, your former group, are they in any way trying to support their the, that community? No, I want to say on a general base like just as a general um rule unwritten rule unspoken rule is we just take care of our own uh you just um and i think yes is kind of like an embarrassment uh, like polygamy is to mainstream lds like yeah. we don't do that right like that's that's <laughs> the wrong way to do it yeah we do it a little bit but we don't do it as much as they do it um so no there's not a huge support and a huge help. A lot of help that they're getting from outside are people that are very distance from, I mean, even mainstream church is not going down there and helping yeah. Hildale. They're scared. Their fear is that if they dig too deep in the doctrine, we're going to lose our members to polygamy. Yeah, not even too deep, right? Just like that. So yeah, yeah, the groups I'm aware of are more of Christian ministries that have gone down there and set up, you know, help and resources and things like that, trying to reach out. So, and I think you know more about that, Steve. Yeah. Than well, I, I wanted here. to actually, now that you brought it up, I've actually never talked about this on camera. I actually meant to talk about it with Christina Rossetti when she was on my program. Of course, she's, she's a well- Oh, I love her. She she's is great. amazing. Yeah. And um, and uh, one of the things we're going to talk about, and, and I it was on my list and everything, was the Dream Center, which is an evangelical organization that is based in, uh, based in actually, uh, California is like their main campus, and uh, but they also opened up a Dream Center down there. Now, what makes my I literally I find these connections I have with Mormonism all the time. I literally my office building when I worked for the city of Hammond was I, I didn't realize it at the time I'm in, we, I had a guy on talking about the 1920 edition of the Book of Mormon. And I worked in the building that that b book was printed in. <laughs> but another thing is I live in a Christian community here in Florida. And the pa the founding pastor, the pastor and his son who founded the Dream Center was giving a sermon here at the church. And he's standing. And all of a sudden he said, "I he got a word from the Lord. And he said, he got confirmation from the Holy Spirit that they were to start the Dream Center. And so for years at this church here, they had a plaque right where he even said, mark this spot. This is the spot where the Dream Center was birthed. And for years, they had a plaque on the stage of where the Dream Center was birthed was right there where he got come from because he, the idea was there. But he, he was actually in the middle of a sermon and he got that confirmation. I, I, 
it's just amazing. So I actually took a picture of me standing there with the pastor uh, a while ago and posted it on my Facebook page. But it, it's just crazy. And and so I'm sorry, I'm kind of get off my soapbox here. But I just it's just an interesting story. How my life's You're a vortex, my, Steve. You're yeah, a vortex yeah. for all things yeah. restoration. And and, and and I know. And one of the things I want to talk. Well, and I'm probably gonna have Christina come back on because I, I actually want to talk a little bit about too about evangelical engagement down there in Short Creek because mm -hmm. I do feel like um, it's not all good. Um, I think yeah. that there are issues going on down there that need to be addressed. And one of these times I hope to get down there, I'd like to, I have connections so I could even probably meet with people at the Dream Center. But I also want to find out what's going on down there and what are some of the, because there's another convergence of the evangelical world into the restoration is down that way too, which I find fascinating. Uh, Liz, I'm just wondering what kind of uh, responses do you have, like uh, interactions you have with evangelicals or your thoughts of like the Dream Center and evangelical groups down there? Yeah. Um, I, I've met, I've worked a little bit. I actually, um, took my daughter down there and we've actually worked right inside the dream center. We helped, uh, decorate, put together beds, um, water fountains, different things that the dream center needed. So we've, I've worked directly with the dream center. And I think that I agree with you, Steve, that there's a lot of good that happens with the dream center. And I'm glad that that space um, I think it's Rule and Jeff's um, home that is the Dream Center, or it's Warren Jeff's home that is the Dream Center is is being utilized wonderfully there. But there is a little bit of conflict. It's hard. I've talked to Native people from Hilldale, and they struggle that sometimes they'll come down and then start preaching to them um, that they want to convert them out of Mormonism into being mainstream Christian. And that part is hard for them because Mormonism is, um, its own culture, its own language, um, its own beliefs that don't necessarily co coincide in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so it's hard that people are coming down and wanting them to switch religions. So it's one thing to come down and help rebuild the community. It's another one where it's like, and, would you like to join where it's like, no, I'm already healing from this religious trauma that I had being Mormon. I don't really like, I'll come to you if I need it, but I don't, that's not part of it that I need. And I know that they've struggled that with that down there. I mean, I personally have not dealt with it. Um, but just speaking with, um, F LDS people that have left, they have run into that a little bit here and there where they have a lot of outside Christian groups coming in and not only helping rebuild the community, which they love and appreciate, but then also wanting them to preach, kind of treating it like a mission. Um, like how can we convert you into being Christian? And that's been hard for them because they have no interest in that. Right. It's like help with strings attached, you know, and that's yeah. important because just help. And then people will see your, see who you are. And if they're interested, then they'll, you know, gravitate towards you, but yeah. So yeah, it's, 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 it's been interesting to see the reception of, of the, the help down there and, and where it's been helpful and where it's not been so helpful for them. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate getting firsthand knowledge there and that you worked <laughs> at the dream center. That's so fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering, do, is there any more media stuff that we want to cover? Uh, we, we, I, I have a question about under the banner of oh, heaven, yeah. you know, not a polygamous group, but mainstream Mormons that read the doctrine and went there, you know, where they hope none of us will go. What was the reception of that? Or was there even an awareness yeah. in the polygamist uh, community about, you know, were they just perceived as, oh, those guys are nuts and they're rogue or, you know, what was the perception? Because again, it's just so close. It's just under the surface of mainstream Mormonism. It's just there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I feel like in some ways, if you're watching a documentary on, let's say, Scientology and their cult-like tendencies as a polygamist or a mainstream LDS person, you can watch that and and go, oh my gosh, that's so crazy and we would never and, and maybe see some similarities between our religion and Scientology, but they that seems to be received better. If you're hitting into a dark part of Mormonism, they have a hard time receiving that and watching that because they're like, oh, great. Another show where they're villainizing Mormons and, and all the dark parts, because that blood atonement not only is, is um, something that the mainstream LDS kind of downplays and pretends like it's not really a thing. So as a mainstream Mormon, that show was hard to watch because they took it 
what it was literally and what a lot of people in early Mormonism taught it like, and then followed it through. Whereas mainstream LDS people don't want to admit that that's a thing that that was a major part. Um, and then you add the polygamist element into it. And they did kind of touch on that in under the banner of heaven, when the brothers went to go explore where they maybe could fit in, in different areas. Um, and he had talked to, uh, it looked like an FLDS person and they had been introduced and he had gone into like he learned how to like cook and got into a hot tub and they were baptized or something. It was one of those moments that leader of that specific group actually was a break off of my grandpa's group. So they actually said under the banner of heaven rule in all red. So I think the detective had said, Oh, that group up there is a break off of rule in all red. So they actually said my grandpa's name in under the banner of heaven, which was so funny to me. Cause then I'm, then I'm Googling like, well, who's this guy? Cause my grandpa actually had a lot of interesting breakoffs from him. Um, one of them actually being after he had been murdered, he had shown up as a spirit to a man and that man started his own church. So that's been an interesting thing that I was unaware of growing up, but found out later. So and that's, that's Benjamin Schaefer's group. Uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that is Benjamin Schaefer's group. And I was unaware of that until I had gone to a sunstone a few years ago and they had missionaries there and they started preaching to me. And, and, and I was like, where did you, where did you get this information? And they're like, Oh, from rule and all red. And I was like, that's my grandpa. What are you talking about? Um, so that was an interesting thing. They, they gave me a pamphlet and it had the whole story of how he had gotten the priesthood. And, and that was mind blowing that there was this community living in Nevada based off of my grandpa's teachings. And I had no idea. So that was super fascinating to me. Um, and I brought it up to my mom actually. And my mom was like, oh yeah, we know who they are. Okay. Apparently other people knew anyway. So under the banner of heaven, um, it was, I felt like catered to ex Mormons in some areas where they focused on some parts of the doctrine that relate very well to ex Mormons. Ex Mormons have certain things that make them very frustrated and they have reasons why they have left the mainstream LDS church. And those reasons seemed to be, put in under the banner of heaven exponentially. Um, and it was like, so as, as someone who has left mainstream LDS church, that's me. Um, I could see how they were kind of feeding into post-Mormon ex-Mormon genre where it was like, Oh, I know that is frustrating. Oh, I do hate that too. And I, yep, they do do that. Um, and so I had a, a faithful mainstream LDS member say, I didn't like that. I didn't like how they focus. Not, not everyone's like that, right? That's, that's what the mainstream LDS people like to say. Well, not every bishop's going to say that not every bishop's coming after, um, these people and expecting them to be more righteous. Not every dad does that. So it was interesting to see the excuses of like the mainstream. And then the polygamists kind of were like, of course, of course, another betrayal of like how awful we are and blood atonement. That's not us, right? AUB is like, that's not us. That's the LeBaron group. That's these brothers. That's it's not us. It's it's someone else. And of course, that's what's in the media. So that was kind of their attitude. I know a lot of people from the AUB didn't even have any interest to watch it. Because they were like, oh, of course, they got to focus on how awful everything is and murdering people. So it's been interesting to see their reactions. Uh, I just want to remind folks that actually the MMR was kind of birthed out of our Under the Banner of Heaven after show where Rebecca and I, uh, originally Rebecca was a guest and I made her the co-host. And then uh, we uh, had different perspectives uh, and uh, so they're all worth watching, but I, I want to maybe particularly point out the one where we had Lindsay Hansen Park. Of course, she has the We Are Polygamy podcast, um, and uh, she was actually hired on as a consultant to Under the Banner of Heaven. And I think that that episode is particularly instructive because a lot of the criticisms that are uh, directed towards the show, I think L Lindsay was able to kind of clarify things and kind of give us a broader perspective of what they were trying to do and maybe some of the decisions that they made. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. I'll leave a link in the description to mm -hmm. the uh, to that series. 
Um, yeah, Re Rebecca. Yeah, the, you know, there's so much now that we're listing everything in order of all this content and all this is, you know, fairly recent. I I would imagine that this is not the end, but the beginning. We may have to do an interview with Liz part two a year or so from now, right? Because <laughs> I can only imagine what's coming down the pike on that. But yeah. but you're right. It's a fascination to people and the darkest sides of any group or religion or situation is always what's more interesting and that's what they show although there is truth there i think even in in the dark things sure often not exactly what it is but that's what we watch that and i guess maybe we should think about that when we watch programs about other religions or other situations is like oh this is just the darkest side this is not <laughs> not representative of, of what's really going on so i think it's good to keep that in mind but this has been just fascinating i mean and, and i know that um, did we talk at all about your aunt's book? Maybe a little bit, because that's going to segue into another thing that Steve is going to do later. So maybe we could talk about that Absolutely. just really briefly at the end, because I found that fascinating that your aunt had, had even gone on a on a talk show back in the day to discuss a little bit. I think that that's a good story, maybe as we end. Yes. So um, as I had mentioned before, I have this aunt. Her name is Dorothy Allred Solomon. And she has written a few books. She's written In My Father's House. Um, that book, I think, is 1984. It's one of her, it's her early experiences of growing up um, as Rulin's daughter. And then she has written this book, Predator, Prey, and Other Kinfolk, Growing Up in Polygamy. I would highly recommend this book. Um, it really gives a good betrayal of, a portrayal of how it was um, living in that house and they had a very fascinating life. Not only was he the leader of this group, they did have to run down to Mexico and it's in this book and um, escape from the law enforcement. And that is where they kind of intersected with the LeBarons. And it's portrayed in the media. If you kind of look it up, you'll see that it says that LeBarons and this, my grandpa's group were kind of rival groups. That's not exactly accurate. He, the LeBarons were kind of on a killing spree for different reasons. One of it being Irvel wanted to consolidate power and have it all for himself. And, and uh, murdering my grandpa was one of many murders that he had done. Um, and so he was collateral damage. My grandpa was, and, and part of it had to do with, he felt he was justified getting my grandpa's tithing funds and that he was the one mighty and strong. And so my grandpa saying that he was, um, a prophet or a leader, that was a threat to Ervil's power. So there's a lot of play and complexity in it. And Dorothy's, my aunt's, um, book is what their perspective as a family going through that and what it was to have those different moms, those moms um, overall very much really loved being married to my grandpa and were very happy being married to him. Um, I've read it a few times. I've done book groups on it. She's a, she's very eloquent, very well-spoken. She's a, she's a beautiful soul and, and very open. And so I highly recommend this book. So this is what she has written. And then the woman that uh, murdered my grandpa was Rena Shanoff and another woman. They were wives of Ervil LeBaron. They, um, and she had written this book in 1990, The Blood Covenant. And from what I understand, I personally have not read it. It's not written very well from what I can understand, but Dorothy, my aunt, um, started a lawsuit where any of that money was given to the family of Rule and Allred and not to Rena. And, and she said, it's not about money. It's about that you're exploiting my father's murder. And that's the part that they're having the issue with. So they did go on Sally, Jesse, Raphael in 1990 and had a whole talk show about it. Rena was there. My aunt was there and they discussed. It was a very, it was very hard to watch. I, I did watch it. I can't find it on the internet anymore. If I'm sure some amazing sleuthers out there can find it if, if they dig really deep, but that's not my skill. Um, but it was in the 1990s. As far as I understand, it was July that they had gone on Sally, Jesse, Raphael and, and discussed this book that Rena had um, released. So um, I have not read it and I, I don't think there's been like a re-release of it. So those are, those are a couple books. And then to kind of give 
an amazing context that I was unaware of until recently. This is a new podcast, fairly new. It's Deliver Us from Ervil. And it's a journalist that goes down and interviews the community in Mexico that was started by um, Ervil and his brothers and their dad. So, and it's, it's a, it very much humanizes the LeBarons and that this part of their history was not only hard for all reds for the AUB, but was extremely difficult for the LeBarons. I was unaware of that. And I, and I didn't really have that perspective because I had grown up with how awful and evil they were just realizing through this podcast that he had gone through and ordered murders of many of the LeBarons and that they also are good people, polygamous people doing the best they can. And they really have this dark stain of Ervil on them too. That was really hard for them to break out of. And, and um, under the banner of heaven had like a little Facebook group that I had joined and a LeBaron was in there. And she, I had put something in there like, oh, one of the episodes was so interesting. They talked about my grandpa Rulin Allred and she had gone on there. So she's the granddaughter. She's a little baron. She had gone on there and she apologized to me for what Ervil had done. And I, it almost broke my heart because she didn't have to apologize for something that she had no control over. She didn't decide that but I have generational trauma from it and she has generational trauma from it. And so it was so fascinating to have that interaction with the LeBaron where she felt like she still needed to apologize for something that was so hard for her and so hard for me. Anyway, I just thought that was um, interesting that something that happened so long ago, 1977, that we're still carrying that with us. Wow. You know, this was a fantastic episode. And I think the key thing is, the human is humanizing people. So what so often gets caught up in the sensationalism is that we we don't realize that these are real human beings. You are a real human being who lives with the implications uh, for, of of your grandfather. And then you have all, it's just people realize that this is not these are not TV shows, folks. These are real people. And I want to thank you so much, Liz, for joining us today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It was fascinating and lovely. And of course I would love to come back. Oh yeah. Well, I can't, we'll be setting something up later for that as well. Um, uh, Rebecca, what'd you think of this episode? Pretty good, huh? Wow. You know, I always think, oh, we can't top the last episode we taped and then we just keep topping it. I, the sky's the <laughs> limit. There's, there's no end to our interesting guests and stories and it's just wonderful. I just love it. Well, I have to say when I was at Sunstone, I was the, uh, umpire for the softball game between i was it was a kickball game kickball game i that's have right. that same hat because we won the higher yep. law one <laughs> higher law one uh 10 to 9 in extra innings and i tell people i was the ump you know and i say well yeah. i kind of you know was able to shift it the other way because i was they bribed me with uh dream mine a uh, scott stock certificates for the dream mine so i i threw the game their way over out of darkness so <laughs> but and that game is where Liz and I met because we came to see you, Steve, do your umpire gig. And while we were there, we gravitated over toward Liz and introduced ourselves and said, would you like to come talk to our book club? And our friendship kind of just started from there. So that, yeah, was, a, yeah. that was another vortex, another pivotal moment where people connect. So yeah. And it was Moroni Jessup's fault that I even went to go do that game. I mean, he was reaching out and saying, Hey, can anyone? And I was like, yeah, I can pay play for the polygamous side. So that's how I ended up in that game anyway, which was so fascinating. It was, it was a great game. Well, folks, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, I just want to remind you, there'll be links in the descriptions to a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. Uh, also, if you want to support us on PayPal as well as Patreon, you can support us financially as well as our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com. There's the coffee mug, the ubiquitous coffee mug it makes its appearance on every Mormon Media Reviews segment. Also, folks, just an quick... MMR mug, Steve. I just realized that I'm holding up the MBR. We've got to branch out. Let's talk to Anthony about it. We're, we're working on it. Uh, I just also want to remind you folks that this week's, uh, this month's uh, book drawing is 52 Churches in 52 Weeks by David Vo Boyce. Um, I've had him on. Um, he comes from a Protestant background, and he, two of his most popular episodes are 
he actually did two episodes about the Mormon church because he, and then now he's got a huge Mormon audience watching this program. And so this, so I just want to remind you, it, there will be email mormonbookreviews at gmail.com and put yourself in the, uh, in the subject line, say book contest, and then put your name and address in there, U.S. residents only. Once again, folks, always remember all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.